Welcome to the first of a series of three sets of readings from my simplified and abridged version of The Perfect Way by Anna Kingsford and Edward Maitland. This late 19th century pioneering work on esoteric Christianity was once described by David Redstone, a former manager of Watkins Bookshop in London as one of the most consummate products of the Theosophical Literary Corpus, a classic exposition of Christian esoteric teaching unjustly neglected in our time. In a bid to undo some of this unjust neglect, these readings will try to make the content of this wonderful book more accessible to all who are drawn to it, but find the language of the original a barrier to understanding it. This initial set of readings are from the opening pages of the first, second, and third lectures of my simplified version of the third edition of The Perfect Way. So I shall begin then with the opening pages of the first lecture, which gives an overview of the work as a whole. The aim of these lectures is to set out a perfect system of doctrine and rule of life, offering a viable alternative to both the traditional presentation of church doctrine and the agnostic materialism that is now rampant everywhere. This is not a new invention, but a recovery of the original system which formed the basis of all religions. Our object in making it available to the world is to restore and rehabilitate the truth by freeing it from the limitations, perversions, and distortions to which it has been subjected over the centuries, and to explain the real meaning of the formulas and symbols which have until now served rather to conceal than to reveal the truth. The system we speak of was recovered by means of the intuition, which represents the knowledge acquired by the soul in its past existences and complements the intellect, since it is only by the equilibrium of both the intellectual and intuitional modes of the mind that truth can be arrived at. But the memory of the soul is not the only factor. The faculty which we call the intuition is completed and crowned by the operation of divine illumination. Thus, the fruits of the soul's experience in the past are supplemented by the grace or luminance of the spirit. And through the combined operation of this light and the enhancement it brings about in the intuitions of the soul, enabling her to convert her knowledge into wisdom, the human race has been from age to age perpetually carried up to higher levels of evolution and will in due course be enabled to realize in itself and to be all that in the past it has known and desired of perfection. So this work represents the result of intuitional memory, stimulated and enhanced, we believe, by illumination of the spirit and developed by the only way of life ever found compatible with signed philosophical aspirations. The doctrine we have recovered is based on two premises, the pre-existence of the soul and the perfectibility of the soul. It is based on the pre-existence of the soul because were it not for her persistence, the process of gradual becoming would be impossible since development depends on memory and is the result of the intelligent application of knowledge gained by experience in order to satisfy the needs of the individual. And it is based on the perfectibility of the soul 
because as a portion of the divine being, which is God, formed from the divine substance and illumined by the divine spirit, the soul is capable of all that her nature implies and competent to realize for the individuality animated by her, the command of the great master of mystical science. Be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. In order to clarify our system, we need to say more on the constitution of man. Our doctrine concerning this is the one that has prevailed from the earliest times and in all the philosophical religions. According to this doctrine, man possesses a fourfold nature, a characteristic which differentiates him from all other creatures. The four elements which constitute him are, counting from the outermost inwards, one, the material body, two, the astral body, which is the seat of the earthly mind, three, the soul, or essential and permanent self, which reincarnates, and four, the spirit, or divine father and life of the system. Bear in mind, with regard to this fourfold nature, that the material body and the astral body jointly comprise man's outer personality for which there is no rebirth, while the soul and the spirit together comprise man's interior personality. The doctrine of the fourfold nature of man finds expression in the Bible where it is symbolized by, firstly, the four rivers of Eden or human nature, flowing from one source, which is God. And secondly, the four elemental living beings of Ezekiel and their four wheels or circles, each of which denotes a region and a principality or power. The doctrine of the fourfold nature of man has its correspondence also in the unit of all organic existence, the physiological cell, which, counting from the outermost inwards, comprises the following four elements. One, the cell membrane or capsule. Two, its fluidic contents. Three, the nucleus. And four, the nucleolus, which is often difficult to detect. Thus man, as the microcosm of the macrocosm, exemplifies in every detail of his system the fundamental doctrine of the famous hermetic philosophy, by which the expression of all true scriptural writings are regulated, the doctrine, namely, of correspondence. As is the outer, so is the inner. As is the small, so is the great. There is but one law, and he that works is one. Nothing is small, nothing is great in the divine economy. These words encapsulate both the principle of the universe and the secret of the intuition, or she, the soul, the divine woman of man's mental system, who opens up for him the perfect way, the way of the Lord, that path of the just, which as a shining light shines more and more onto the perfect day. And her complete restoration, crowning and glorification is the one essential condition for realizing the ideal perfection of man's nature, which mystically, is called the finding of Christ. When the uninitiated or materialists deny absolutely the possibility of positive knowledge and declare that all we know is nothing can be known, they speak truly 
as far as they and their like are concerned. This was well understood by the Apostle Paul when he said, The natural man perceives not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. And he cannot know them because they are spiritually discerned. But the spiritual man judges all things, and he himself is judged of no man. While the two orders indicated here refer to the outer and the inner, or body and soul, of each individual, they refer also to the two great divisions of mankind, they who as yet recognize only the body, and they who are sufficiently developed in their interior nature as to recognize the soul also. Those initiated into the sacred mysteries fall into the latter category. Since the enemy of spiritual vision is always materiality, it follows that by becoming less material, man acquires the seeing eye and hearing ear for divine things. This does not mean that man must separate the soul from the body, but rather purify both soul and body from preoccupation with material things. So the nature and function of the intuition is as follows. Through purity of thought and deed, and the resolute cultivation of harmonious relations between his material and his spiritual self, in order to bring the whole of his system under the control of the divine central will, whose seat is in the soul, the man gains full access to the stores of knowledge garnered up in his soul and attains cognition of both God and the universe. Placed as she is between the outer and the inner and acting as mediator between the material and the spiritual, the soul looks inwards as well as outwards. And according to the degree of her elevation, purity and desire, she sees, reflects and transmits God. It is on account of the soul's position between the inner and outer worlds and her consequent ability to refer things to their essential ideas that in her and her alone, there resides an instrument of knowledge capable of comprehending truth, even the highest, which only she is able to see face to face. It is true that the man cannot see God, but the divine in man sees God. And this occurs when, by means of the soul's union with God, the man becomes one with the Father and sees God with the eyes of God. Where there is no understanding, there is no real knowledge. But the knowledge that is acquired through the soul involves the understanding of all things. In the absence of such knowledge, in the absence of such knowledge and understanding, belief is impossible, as belief that is not based on knowledge is not worthy to be called belief. And the only belief that saves is the belief which is combined with understanding. For the rock on which the true church is built is the understanding. Such is the meaning of the words of Jesus after Peter's acknowledgement of him as the Christ. It was not to the man Simon that Jesus said, You are Peter, the rock, and upon this rock will I build my church. But to the eternal and unchanging spirit of understanding, by means of which the disciple had found Christ. What Jesus said did not refer to the man, but to the spirit informing the man and discerned by the master with his spiritual eyes. Therefore, the real chief of the apostles in the true church, 
that which alone can open the gates of eternal life by its knowledge of the mysteries of existence is the understanding. But the priesthoods, who always place a material construction on divine things, have applied the words of Jesus to the man Simon and his successors in office with the most disastrous of consequences. Ignoring the understanding and putting asunder what God has joined together, reason and faith, they have made something other than mind the criterion of truth. And it is this divorce between the masculine and feminine elements of man's intellectual system that has caused the prevailing lack of belief and converted religion into superstition. The priest is the last person entitled to reproach the world for its want of faith, since it is his degradation of the character of God that has fostered lack of belief. Suppressing the woman, that is the intuition, by putting themselves in her place, the priests have suppressed also the man, that is the intellect, intellect and have thereby extinguished the whole of humanity. To replace the practice we have denounced, this work will offer the original method, method of all true churches and will appeal to the consensus of all the faculties comprising man, which is essentially common sense. It is not on the authority of any book, person, tradition, or order that we rely, or that we invite the attention of others. Reference will be made, as already, to the various sacred and other sources, but only it only for illustration, interpretation, or confirmation. And confident in the knowledge that all things proceed from mind, and that mind is able to understand all things, and also that mind is eternally one and the same, we have no fear of antagonism between the perceptions of the present and those of the past. But it should be remembered the appeal is, in all cases, to perception, and in no case to prejudice or convention.